What I'd like to ask you about uh, is your thoughts on the changes uh, to uh, introduced by the government to higher education, uh, in that students now have to pay for themselves. Uh, there's far more. Uh, there, there will be far more of a free market uh, in the system than there ever was. I'm very much against the present scheme. Um, I advocated, with no success whatsoever, a rather extreme form of the graduate tax. Um, I think that paying up front uh, makes students of the sort I was apprehensive about paying it back in the end. And I know the government says, and the government's right to say, you don't pay until you get to a certain level of income. But there's a certain sort of student from poorer backgrounds, not only poorer backgrounds, but backgrounds that make them worried about loans and debts, were going to be deterred. What I wanted to see was a student tax or graduate tax, but a graduate tax that doesn't simply apply to this year's graduates and next year's graduates. It seemed to me that people like me ought to be contributing towards this. We were part of what I'll call the golden age of studentship. I mean, I never I had no idea about student fees. I went to university and somebody paid the fees without me knowing about it. Uh, it came as a shock to me there were such things as fees because I got a state scholarship and the government sent a cheque to the university. I got an annual grant of £220 a year, which doesn't sound very much now, but was enough to live on as long as I worked for a couple of weeks on a court milk round in the summer. And we had it terribly easy. And it seemed to me that we ought to make a contribution to current students who are having it terribly hard. So I want a very extreme form of graduate tax. It won't be that, but I think there is a chance when a new government comes in there'll be a graduate tax of some sort. And the other thing I'd like to ask you about is Harold Wilson. Every year we have what is the Harold Wilson Lecture. You knew the man very well. What, what, was, what was your opinion of him in terms of his well, legacy as a Prime Minister? Well, Harold and I had what you might call an asymmetrical arrangement, an asymmetrical relationship. Um, I liked and admired him and he didn't like and admire me. Um, he believed that I was constantly pl plotting to replace him by Roy Jenkins, which wasn't true. I was only occasionally plotting <laughs> to replace him by Roy Jenkins, uh, which is why I never got in Harold's cabinet. Indeed, Harold actually, it's a piece of brutality, and then I'll give you an opinion, uh, still makes me breathless. There was, I was always in the newspapers, next reshuffle, Roy Hatter will go in. And one night there was a reshuffle on the cards, voting in the House of Commons, his PPS said the Prime Minister would like to see you at the end of the lobby. So I thought, this is a big moment, he's going to say, come and see me tomorrow. So I went to see him and he said, look here, I reckon you something you ought to learn. When there's promotion in the wind, it's better to have one Prime Minister on your side than ten newspapers. End of conversation. <laughs> and so I had to wait for Harold to give up, and the next day I was in the cabinet. <laughs> um, but uh, that being said, I was a, remain a great admirer of Harold Wilson's. And I think he looks better as the years go by. I, like all Prime Ministers, at the end of his reign, nothing but criticism. But looking back on what he achieved, it's very substantial. His first government was a wonderfully radical government in terms of social policy. Um, they did many things to stabilise the pound, which needed doing. And I admired him as a party politician because he had this overwhelming desire to keep the Labour Party in one piece. And that he did in all sorts of ways. If you take the obvious example of Vietnam, he knew he had to support America in some way over Vietnam because we were dependent on them economically, but we never sent a single soldier to Vietnam. We managed to keep out of it, and quite rightly so, and very largely because he wanted to keep Labour Party in bounds. I know that Lyndon Johnson told him, uh, just send us a bagpiper, he said, just send somebody to show your presence here, and he wouldn't do it. And that was the sort of thing Harold did supremely well. I remain a pro Harold Wilson Labour man. Uh, wherever he is, um, he might... I'm not sure he's a pro hattersley I because he never was then and probably won't ever become one. <laughs> and can Ed Miliband lead the Labour Party to victory at the next election? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I voted for Ed Miliband, I campaigned for Ed Miliband. Um, Ed Miliband has a great advantage of being Labour. And it's about time the Labour Party had a leader who was actually Labour rather than something else. He's ideologically right for the Labour Party. He's got to do something which he's only just beginning to do, which he's got to appeal over the normal concept of what a Prime Minister looks like. I don't apologise for saying he is not the conventional view of how a Prime Minister looks and behaves. He's got to be the ideological candidate. I've written this cliché, 
uh, I repeat the cliche, he was the candidate of conviction to lead the Labour Party and he had to be the candidate of conviction to win the election, saying this is what we believe in, this is what is right. Not the normal opinion poll stuff, the focus group stuff. But I've no doubt he can win and I think as things are going he will win. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.